I used to have friends who had been in bands for like 10, 15 years with the same artist, you know, uh, <clears throat> and the same artist who worked relatively consistently. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never been, I've never done that. Jean-Luc was the only artist that I've worked with for the number of years that I did. <clears throat> but even so, that wasn't, you know, all the time where that's your bread and butter. So, uh, you know, if you're, I don't know if it's lucky, I don't know what the criteria is, but luckily for me, you know, when I finish one thing, it might be a little low, but something else would always come up or I'd seek out something and, you know, I'd always end up in a different situation. And then there were times where you're trying to figure out, okay, this thing starts from June to July, but this other one starts at the end of July and you have to make these hard choices of, do I do this gig or do I do that gig? Because I can't do both because they overlap yeah. or things like that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. And, you know, I, I've, unlike somebody who goes to a nine to five and works the same job all the time, I rarely know in the course of a year what my year is going to look like financially. But somehow it always works out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, some depend, I, I assume that depending on the artist, you know, how many tours you do, you know, how many, you know, how many people are going to be that particular artist. I think you, you guys work at a percentage to see if it's competing for you or not, right? So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and it's tough when you're married and have a family and kids, you know, live yes. and then coming back home in two months from now, it's not this. You know, it's easy for me. I go and see you with the band. I drink my beer. I go home. Right? <laughs> but you guys go to, you know, finish at 11, drink a beer. You cannot fall asleep because you're wired up. You go up to a bus, sleep in the hotel, and then 7 o'clock in the morning, either, you know, get to a hotel or catch a flight somewhere else. It's, yeah. it's not well, a glamorous life, you know. It's tough. Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I always say it's... it's it's the life. It's the life I chose, and the life that that chose me. Because I always felt like, well, I always felt like it chose me because I, I I didn't have a choice to a degree in doing it. It was like, oh man, I have to do this. This is what I'm going to do. I have to, you know. Yeah. When when you decided that music was your thing right, early, I, I think I knew when I was. I think I knew when I was uh, in grade school. Uh, really? Yeah, my my like I said my uncle was Clifford Brown, jazz trumpet yeah. player. Yeah, and there was always a picture of him on the mantle in my house, and we used to listen to his records. So the idea of being a musician it wasn't like a far fetched thing for me. And you know, like I said, my mother sang. Uh, my oldest brother Robert, when I was uh, maybe six or seven he was the first one to be in a, a group we used to live in houston texas and he's in a group called wali and the afro caravan and he played kungus and it was a lot of african percussion and a singer and stuff like that so uh just the idea of being a musician wasn't some far-fetched thing that you know was unattainable so, like I said, I think I knew when I was in grade school, it's like, oh, I think that's what I want to do. I want to play drums, and that's what I want to do. So, And you got the encouragement of your, your dad, your mom, you know, go for it. And Yeah, yeah. My mother, in particular, was because uh, she was a music major, and because of her brother, uh, she got me lessons, drum lessons, when I, I was 10. Started, well, I got my first drum when I was 10. I played in, you know, grade school. And then I didn't take uh, private lessons until I was about 13. So you had the, the first two years, you pretty much began on your own? I, yeah, originally, yeah, because I just had a field drum. So I played traditional traditional uh, grip. Yeah, right. yeah. But then when I got a drum set, actually before I got a drum set, my brother's band, when we moved back to Indianapolis, my brother started playing in bands. And I'd go to a rehearsal sometimes. 
And uh, one time the drummer let me sit down on his drums and it was a, you know, old three piece kit with one rack tom here, a ride cymbal on the bass drum and a floor tom. And I sat down to play. And the first thing I did was switch my left hand to the ride cymbal, which was on the right. And I played like that, hmm. you know? So, uh, you know, I don't know why I did that, but it was just kind of the natural thing for me to do. So when I actually got a drum set, I ended up playing left-handed instead of right-handed. Although when I used to go to my lesson, uh, my teacher, I'd play my lesson right-handed because he was uh, from the symphony orchestra and he was, you know, traditional. This is the way you play, you play traditional grip. You know, you play the drums like that, and, you know, everything. Uh, so I would go to my lesson and play that way. Then when I went home and played gigs, I would play uh, match grip. And then finally, I would kind of talk to him about it. You know, I really want to play this way. And he'd say, no, no. And then finally, I convinced him. He said, okay, well, go ahead. Play your lesson. Play, play your lesson, match grip, left-handed. And I did that. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, you know, you should cool. play that way. Yeah. And he told me years later, he said that I kind of opened up his mind to teaching students the way that they need to be taught as opposed to, you know, the strict and only has to be like this and nothing else. Yeah, wow, man. And then after that, from 97 to what, to 2000, you were with the, the Eiley brothers, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 96, I was with the Eiley brothers. Uh, I think prior to that, though, after Michael Jackson, I did a little, it was very, it was very short, but I did a little stint with uh, Bette Midler. Oh, wow. And we recorded uh, this HBO show called Diva Las Vegas. Just a one, one concert performance. Uh, we did that in Vegas that year. And it's funny how you, when you're in something, when you're really immersed in something, you don't realize how, you don't realize how much work it is until after the fact. At least I didn't. I listened to some of that stuff later. I was like, that was a lot of information that we were playing up there, you know? <laughs> but when you're in it, you're just in it and you get it done. But uh, you also, I saw that show recently. I think I have it on a DVD or something. And I was watching, I was like, we we're playing a lot of stuff. So yeah, I was with Bet for a little while and then uh, Isaac Brothers for, yeah, about four years actually. Man, so before you go into Isaac Brothers, it, it's difficult to learn going from Anita Baker to Beth, uh, Beth Midler to the Ali brother, learn new things, learn the, the repertoire, adjusting to the personality of the people, or is it easy or, or, or it uh, I mean, for me, it's, I don't know, it's always been relatively easy. My, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if it's something that my mother ingrained in me when I was younger, but when I first started playing, when I was in high school and my mother would uh, see me play or I'd be playing some high school concert or something. And I played timpani in high school too. But my mother would say, oh, Rayford can play anything. Meaning I could play any style of music, you know. Uh, and you know, I don't know if it was something she noticed or just she was just being a mother and saying that kind of thing. But as I got older and got in all these different situations, uh, I don't know, it just came kind of easy to me. I, I think if you can hear it and notice what the essence of whatever that music is that makes it different from, if you can notice what makes Beth's music different from Isley Brothers music and hone in on that, then, you know, you pretty much got it covered. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's all music. It's just about how you approach it and what the sensibilities of that particular genre are. And then every bit in, in between. So when you know you got the, the, the deal with the Eiley brother or the, with Anita Baker, it's a lot of rehearsing that you guys do with the band like a month before or a week? Or? 
Uh, <laughs> without, some people like well, to rehearse, some people don't. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, Anita, yeah, with Anita, we, we rehearsed a lot, uh, especially the first tour. I think she was, she had sold like, I don't know, three, four million records, and uh, it was going to be a big tour. She was headlining. We are doing like arena shows. Wow. So, yeah, we rehearsed a long time, uh, maybe at least three weeks, if I remember right. Uh, close to a month, I'm not sure. But uh, conversely, if I remember right, my first gig with the Isaac Brothers was a last minute thing where somebody was supposed to do it. They couldn't do it. I got a call like on a, I don't know if it was that morning or the night before. It was like, hey, we got this show and such and such. Uh, that guy's somebody was supposed to do it. They can't do it. Can you do it? Are you available? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna leave. You know, tomorrow. I just remember getting on a plane and listening to a cassette with the bass player and writing notes, and he's telling me what we're supposed to do. And I had never even played with him before. It's just like, you know, I'm on a plane going to the gig and learning the show. So, uh, and I think after that, that's when I started started working with him. Wow. Oh, oh, but it got to be difficult now, man. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it helps when you have some kind of idea of what the music is about. And, you know, for me, I used to listen to them when I was, you know, a teenager. So the hits I already knew. Some of the new stuff I wasn't that familiar with, but you knew what the vibe was and you knew how some of the music went. So the rest was just, okay, do this here and do that there. And, and then just the sensibilities of knowing how to play with a group, you know, uh, when to be quiet, when to be loud. And for me, I always, whoever the artist is, my eyes rarely, rarely come off the artist because they're going to let you know pretty much when, what you need to be doing. When, when it's your turn to shine, well, well not, not even so much that, but just in the course of the music, uh, based on the way that they're singing, based on the body language, yeah, you can tell what, you know, if you should be aggressive or if you should be more laid back or if you should be loud or quiet. And it's yeah. not like they're giving you individual personal instruction. Yeah. It's just reading the body language of what they're doing, yeah. you know. So, uh, and I don't know where I... I got that from, but I've just always done it. <laughs> and then when you go to one to band, they they provide like a standard, a standard uh, drum set, or you need, or you bring your own. Well, it it depends on the situation. With the Isaac Brothers, we were all well. One tour, we were a uh, few tours. We were just using backline equipment, you know, equipment provided by the promoters. Uh, but another tour, we took all our own gear. So it just depends on how they budget everything and what what's best for the artist to do. Yeah. Well, and then you 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 and, and your brother Reggie, I think began working in before you have that, that accident. Uh, you began working your first CD, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I started it and uh, yeah, and I had my accident and then we finished it after. Uh, and at the time he was living here in California with me and we built the studio and <laughs> the studio I'm sitting in, yeah. uh, Wally Minko, yeah, he Wally, would play yeah. with Jean-Luc. Yeah. He built this studio. He built this place. So it was like, there was a garage here, but all the interior and the soundproofing and everything he built pretty much by himself. <laughs> but you hired to, for him to do, or you bought the whole the, the house from him? No, 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 no. I already had the house, but I, yeah, I hired him to help you. Out. Yeah, to he, you know, he was into construction and stuff like that, and you know, we were talking, and he's like, "Oh man, you should, you should let me let me build the studio," and I was like. Okay, sure. <laughs> Go for it, man. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, he pretty much did it 
himself is 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 pretty amazing. And I ended up, you know, my my first record we recorded just about everything here. Wow. Yeah, Wally. Yeah, I never never talked to him. Also, I want to interview him, but he seemed he's he seemed like a very nice very nice person, quiet, I suppose, you know. Mm -hmm. But he's a nice guy. Man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes, I may have met some musicians that they're crazy, man. After the gig, they're, they're are, are two different people, you know? Yeah. Like, Jan Luke was the person I have seen him, I have seen a met over the year, the same guy that I sort of interviewed yesterday. But other, there can be other people that are, are very different. In real mm -hmm. life, it's very different for the person that I saw playing the keyboard or guitar. Yeah. And somehow I, I don't know why, but I have interviewed a lot of drummers, man. Simon Phillips from Toto, just yeah. like, you know? then uh, from Pan Metheny, Paul Huertico, mm -hmm. Antonio Sanchez. All, all, all the drummers are very nice people. I don't know why. Some... <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's Jamie. Well, not... Jamie, for example, is cel... what's that? Jamie uh -huh. is, is a, a very different person. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's his personality, and he tells Joe in the interview. <laughs> He's a nice yeah. guy. It's different. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but very good people. And then with the accent, you know, obviously we don't want to go into detail. But you were out for like a couple, a couple of years, right? A year and a half. Uh, you know, strangely enough, it, it was it wasn't that long. It was a. Uh, I broke my back in se September of uh, of two thousand. Yeah. And uh, I was on, I mean, I was in a wheelchair at first. I couldn't walk at all. Yeah. And uh, doing physical therapy and stuff. Then it was crutches for a while. And I still had a back brace I had to wear. Then it was a cane that I used for a while. Uh, and except my brother was living here with me. Um, I had the accident in September. I actually got married in December. So between September and December, uh, I was actually up kind of moving around again, but I was still using a cane. Uh, and I remember one day I came, I knew I wanted to play and I didn't know when to do it based on my recovery. I didn't have any particular date in my mind or anything like that. I still had the back brace. By then I was using the cane. I could get around with the cane, but I still had to wear a back brace. And one day I decided, I said, I think I'm gonna go and try to play today. And my brother was here and he was in the control room. And I went in the studio. I sat down behind the drums. And I remember I hit the bass drum with my foot and it was like, <clears throat> I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, it was like really loud, louder than it had been before the accident. And then I realized, oh, I've been doing all this physical therapy because they had me, you know, laying down, pushing weights with my legs and doing all this stuff. Yeah. So in some ways I was stronger than I was before the accident. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I sat down and I played and, you know, everything kind of came back. It was a little awkward because I had this big hard plastic back brace from here sure. all the way down to my waist. Uh, but, you know, I realized, okay, I can still play. So once I get this thing off and get stronger, then I should be all right. Yeah. Any, any stories with the Ali brothers that you can tell uh, that we'll record without regretting it later? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was just kind of, it was kind of a wild ride, really. I mean, when you think about it, because even on stage, he would say, I mean, I think Shout, he wrote Shout. You know, you make me want to shout. He wrote that. The eyes, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, so many other groups recorded that song, but he wrote that in 1959. Wow. And you think about it, it's like, man, this cat has been 
playing major shows since 1959. So that in itself used to just kind of trip me out. But Ronald was, he was very cool. When I first got in the band, it was Ronald Isley, the lead singer, Ernie Isley on guitar. And uh, their brother Marvin was playing bass. But between 96 and 2000, when uh, I stopped doing it, I think Mar Marvin took ill and he stopped playing. It was somebody else playing bass. And, uh, uh, but it, I mean, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun because every song was a hit. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're doing great shows. They had dancers and uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, quite sure that, you know, I don't know how many of the original Wiley Brothers they're alive, but those guys financially did very well. They have too many, you know, too many number one hits or so. You know, oh, yeah. The yeah. Year. So they're, they're not poor. No, <laughs> no, doing okay. <laughs> doing all right, man. They, they don't, you know, it's, uh, and then after that, you um, you you did it, your release, your first uh, CD, right? It's called, it was Rebirth of the Cool, right? Or, yeah, Rebirth of the Cool was, uh, yeah, that was like 2003, I think, yeah. Um, and some of the songs I'd written a few years prior, and some of them I wrote, you know, specifically for the record. Uh, yeah, Jamie's on one song that I'd written a few years earlier, a song called Every Time I See You. Yeah. Uh, kind of a sort of pop rock ballad kind of thing. You know, pop rock jazz ballad. <laughs> yeah. You. you know what I was, it just occurred to me now that you mentioned Jamie and once I get a hold of Wally, we should do like a, you know, an interview and bring the the lineup, you know? Bring yeah. Jamie, Wally, and yourself, and mm -hmm. the guy who play bass. Uh, well, uh, Baron the, Brown was the original when I got in, well, no, Jay, uh, Randy Jackson was playing when I first got in John Luke's band, but yeah. the, he only did one tour. Then the uh, it was, the, was Baron Brown. I was the one from 218. The last, you played, played, played. the last time I saw you was the one that you guys did. Um, oh, 2018? Two, yeah, 2018. Yeah. Was, was, was it Keith? Yeah, Keith was the bass. Yeah, Keith Jones, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, Keith Jones was with us back in 82, too. I well, um, invite all of the four of you, man. Yeah, you man. Know, right? Why not? It'll be it'll be a hoot. It'll be a lot of laughing. <laughs> you guys don't you, you guys don't talk to each other. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Or, yeah. Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I talked to Jamie a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think I talked to Keith. Uh, uh, might have been around Christmas time, maybe. Uh, haven't talked to Wally in a little while, but I mean, you know, whenever we do get together, there's a lot of laughing because we we all go way back and you know a lot of shared experiences you know <laughs> we may even call John Luke on day man <laughs> he gave me his he gave me his not his cell number his landline number in, in Paris so you know yeah but of course I don't want to use it he was yeah, yeah. want to be respectful for the guy but um, but yeah I, 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 will, I will think about it man <laughs> I, I will. I will call Ray. You know, Wally next, and then I will. I will. I I know that Jamie is up there. You know, <laughs> but Jamie's always working. He's doing some stuff on television, and yeah, he's he's a busy guy. He's always got something going. He's always got some plates spinning. Yeah, and then he got the, all the animals and rabbits and all that stuff. He take care of that. He, he told me that yeah. when there's no music, my my animals, my guys are okay. Man. <laughs> So, um, and then, um, and then you guys in two, uh, 211, uh, you know, if you want to elaborate on the Anderson Ponte experience, how many, how many gigs you guys did, remember? With, uh, and what? With John Anderson. And John oh, uh, yeah, that was actually kind of cool. And once again, you know, I used to listen to Yes when I was in high school, you know, Fusion and progressive rock, you know, I used to listen to all that stuff. So, uh, Sean Luke called and said, they're thinking about doing 
thing with John Anderson and, uh, you know, we were going to fly to, where did we go to Colorado and do this recording and I mean, do a rehearsal and then do a recording and make a record. And I don't, I don't remember how many shows we did. I think we did two, two separate tours, if I remember right. Uh, uh, and John is, John Anderson is, man, it's hard to describe, hard to describe him. I don't know what, <laughs> if Jamie talked about him or not, but I mean, to me, he's one of those people who is so creative. He, his creativity, creativity is like a waterfall. It's just like constantly going and, and, you know, he can't turn it off. Not that he should, but it's just. It's always ideas. I said, we should do this. I was try this, try this, just constantly. And uh, and I was really impressed with his voice, man. He sounded, he sounded the same way he did in the 80s. 30, 30 years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Crystal clear and uh, really, really interesting guy. Really interesting guy. A lot of fun to be with. Different personalities between John and John Luke? For yeah. Yeah, I mean, John is kind of like this, and Jean Luc is, just, yeah. you know, Jean Luc's pretty, pretty calm. So they sort of balanced each other out in yeah. the course of what we were doing, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised that in the lineup that uh, Ponti and Anderson put together, then. All, all the Ponti guys, you guys, end up, you know, touring with them. I, I, yeah. I'm surprised that John Anderson didn't say, oh, yeah, no, I want my drummer, I want my piano well, guy. My, my understanding at the time that we, that Jean-Luc and uh, at the time they put all, the, all of it together, yeah. uh, I think John was pretty much doing solo shows. So he didn't have a band per se. Oh, I see. Yeah, and you know all the yes guys. That was a whole separate thing that he wasn't really dealing with or collaborating with at that time. So he did have a get. He had a guitar player initially when we started the project, but the guitar player had some other TV show he was doing and a few things on his plate, and it ended up not working out for him to finish the recordings and do the tour. So that's when Jean-Luc called Jamie in. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. it he didn't really have a band, so kind of ended and, up being Jean-Luc. And, Jay, and Jamie say, well, I want Rayford. And then Rayford say, I want, I want the other. <laughs> you, you are like a, you know, like a gang, all the guys. <laughs> like an Italian mafia, you know. If you want one, you need the other, you know. Uh, no, Jean Luc put it together because he, I mean, the nature of the music, because we we're doing some of his music yeah, yeah. and John Anderson's music, and realistically, he knew that we could cover whatever needed to be covered, you yeah. know. And at the end of the day, that's really anybody who gets a gig, it's really about can you do the job that needs to be done, you know. Plus, you know, you, you've been playing with Jean Luc for that many years, and you need yeah. to only learn. John Anderson sure. stuff, right? right. You right. Half the show you already knew, right? So yeah, yeah. So it wasn't that difficult to hire a new person. Man, hopefully, you know, I can, you know, uh, I can get a hold of John Anderson.